Welcome everyone to our summer uh, New Voices series that's focused on Duchatelet. And our first talk uh, tonight will be by Andrea Reichenberger, who uh, works on the history and philosophy of science at the Institute of Philosophy at the University of Hagen in Germany. And her some of her interests include uh, women's contributions to logic, mathematics, and computer science. And uh, she's also worked previously at the Center for the History of Women, Women Philosophers and Sciences, Scientists at Paderborn University, which is where I work now and which is hosting this uh, event. And it's also maybe worth mentioning among, among other things that Andrea's uh, dissertation was published uh, by Springer and it's on uh, Emily Chatelet's Institution de Physique. It was published in 2016. And the uh, talk tonight is entitled, uh, The Storm is Hitting Too. Uh, it's entitled, Emily de Chatelet is a Key Figure of the European Enlightenment, Challenges and Perspectives for Research and Teaching Practices. So the floor is yours, Andrea. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me. And now I'm too fast. So um, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm very pleased to be able to present something about Emily Duchatelet today. The aim of my talk is to give a broad overview of Duchatelet's work and impact, and at the same time to outline the current state of research. I must confess, that's a challenging undertaking because many of those who are taking part in the event today are more competent than I am. So um, when I did my Duchatelet research, um, it was at a time when no one was care about Duchatelet. And meanwhile, I'm um, out of the research. I'm doing completely different things. So um, in any case, um, that's not the point. I hope that my presentation will give some worthwhile suggestions for all experts and newcomers who are interested in Duchatelet's work. Um, Emily Duchatelet is among those women who illuminated the Enlightenment through the writings. Through their intellectual salons, women played a pivotal role in spreading the ideas of the European Enlightenment, but Duchatelet accomplished still more than that. She was among the French mathematicians, physicists, philosophers who revolutionized science and altered the way we look at the world. In Syria, she established a research center which became part of a huge network linked to the European academies. And she transformed and modernized the physics of Newton's Principia. She led a solid foundation for the principle of the conservation of energy. And her thoughts found their way into the encyclopedia. And her engagement in favor of human reason played an important role in the intellectual movement shaping the face of Enlightenment philosophy. So, um, what I'm presenting is here after a short introduction, um, give an overview of Emily de Chatelet's way, not to Newton, but beyond Newton. And then I will say some words on our heritage and reception. Um, and then I come to the crucial points of my talk, the challenges for research and the challenges for science education or teaching practices. In the fall of 1795, Francesco Algarotti, who was preparing a book about Newton, visiting, visited Syria. As early as 1728, Algarotti had carefully replicated several of Newton's optical experiments at the University of Bologna. And in Syria, Algarotti finished a popular scientific work on um, Newton for Ladies, first published in Venice 1737. This bestseller translated in several languages made Algarotti in European famous and 
one of the representatives for what became in the 18th century a Boston Newtonian industry. Now, under Emily and Voltaire, Siri became a center of this intellectual and philosophical movement beyond popularization of Newtonian physics. Partly inspired by Algorotti's visit, the Marquis and the Voltaire began to study Newton's optical and gravitational theories and experiments more intensively. Voltaire, in close ex exchange with Dula Châtelet, was working on a book, um, Elements de la Philosophie de Newton. At the same time, Du Châtelet critically distanced herself from Voltaire's reading of Newton. Also, she helped to support Voltaire's publication. She was working herself on a profound transformation of Newtonian science. In 1740, she published Institution de Physique, her magnum opus, and two years later under her name. Reviews of this book and other kinds of engagement with it appeared in English, French, Italian, German, during Du Châtelet's lifetime. The Institution covered a wide range of philosophical topics, from the basic principles of reasoning and our knowledge of God, the questions concerning the proper views of space, time, matter, and the laws of nature. The work provides long discussions of the latest research regarding gravity, including presentations of Galileo's results and Newton's more comprehensive work. Show us often have suggested that Du Châtelet attempted to integrate Cartesian, Newtonian, and Leibnizian philosophy, but this interpretation is not beyond this book. In fact, Du Châtelet's Institution sought to reconcile complex ideas from the leading thinkers, not of the 17th, but also from the 18th century of her time, among them James Urien, the Bernoullis, um, William Bravesan, Christian Wolf, etc., etc. And with her critical examination of the state of research, Du Châtelet gained a key role, not only in the Newtonian industry of Enlightenment philosophy and science, um, but um, beyond Newton. Um, and this is exactly um, what uh, Ruth Hagen Group's research team at Paderborn University tries to show. Um, for meanwhile, several years, and um, thanks to this research team, we know a lot about the reception of Emily du Châtelet in the German Enlightenment, um, often known by its German name Aufklärung. And this reception illustrates the complex and multifaceted interdependencies of scientific and intellectual networks of the 18th century. In this context, translations of du Châtelet's work works played a paradigmatic role in tracing the um, dissemination of ideas across national borderlines. For example, in 1741, uh, Louise Adel Gunde Victoria Gotchet translated Du Châtelet's dispute with Maron, a leading member of the French Academy of Science. Du Châtelet argued in this work in favor of the Leibnizian living force and its measure. Force integrated over distance is proportional to the chance in living force. Gottsched's translation was anonymously reviewed in several journals, for example, in the German journal Neue Zeitungen von Gelehrten Sachen, and um, also in um, the Göttingsche Gelehrte Anzeigen. You can see a picture here. And um, not to forget to mention is um, Adolf Balthasar, Wolf Adolf, Balthasar Adolf von Steiner's translation of uh, Du Châtelet's Institution Physique. And uh, Steiner's German translation became subject in German newspapers and journals too, such as in Belustigungen des Verstandes and Witzes, in Deutsche Akta Eruditorum, etc. And in the same year, Abraham Gotthold Kessner published an article in the German journal Belustigung des Verstandes in Witze, entitled Brief über den leeren Raum bei Zurücksendung der Naturlehre der Marquise du Châtelet. 
The show note was edited by Johann Joachim Schwabe, a member of the Gottschalk Circle in Leipzig. Kessner stated that Du Chatelier was too little British and too much German. That would mean that you would follow Leibniz and Wolf too closely and Newton too little by rejecting absolute empty space. An anonymous author defended Du Chatelier in the September issue of the same year, and Kessner replied, mocking the monodists as ghost seers. And then Christoph Müllius, one of the Kessner students and a member of the Gottschalk Circle, intervened in the debate. Kessner reacted again. Finally, Johann Gottfried Gade published his reply from Lehren Raum. In 1763, Friedrich Eberhard Boysen from Quedlinburg who edited Euler's Vernünftige Gedanken von dem Raum mit dem Ort der Dauer und der Zeit, um, yeah, published also this uh, dispute, which I have now, um, illustrate in short um, words. So um, this gives you an insight of the um, relevance of Du Chatelet's German reception. And of course, an examination of Du Chatelet's work can also be found in Immanuel Kant's early work, Thoughts on the True Estimation of Living Forces, just to mention a further example. But not only in Germany, also in France, Italy, the Netherlands, and even Greece, Du Chatelet was recognized and discussed. For example, Rudolf Joseph Boscovich, a Croatian scientist and philosopher, was influenced by Du Chatelet when he became engaged in the study of Newton's theories. In Philosophia Naturalis Theoria, Boscovich proposed the idea of an omniscient spirit that, based on Newton's laws and on the knowledge of all of those forces and initial positions at one moment, would have complete knowledge of the past and the future. Following essential identical postulates, the French scientist Pierre Simon Laplace formulated the classical deterministic principle nearly half a century later. That spirit or intelligent entity, um, to use the common metaphors at the time, was termed later by Emile Du bois ramons Laplace Demon. Also, its origin dates back to Du Chatelet's Leibniz interpretation of the eternal geometry. Another example, Eugenius Vulgaris, one of the major Greek agents of the Enlightenment in his time, was influenced by the German reception of Du Chatelet's Institution Physique. Vulgaris played an important mediating role for the reappearance of metaphysics in natural philosophy books during modern Greek Enlightenment. Last but not least, Emily de Chatelet's concept of the hypothesis with her methodological framework of an architecture of knowledge based on fundamental principles challenged not only Newton's hypothesis on finger, but were lessons pieces for the Condillac, Leclerc, Comte, Buffon, Albrecht, Haller, etc. So far, a short overview. Now, let me come to some challenges for research. It's clear what we need much more are new editions and translations of Du Chatelet's work and legacy. There are already some exemplary projects in this area. Um, and I will just give you some examples and then I will come to some examples for conceptualizations. And I will argue that new editions and translations are the cornerstones for a better and deeper contextualization. Contextualizations which deepens our historical and systematic insights and broadening perspectives. So examples. You all know, I think, the new online edition of the Institution de Physique at the Center for the History of Women Philosophy and Scientists at Paderborn University. Another example, um, essay Solaroptic, the Basel manuscript, which was edited for the first time by Bruce Grissel and Fritz Nagel and Andrew Yanyak. 
1717. Um, not to forget to mention is Catherine Bredding's translation of Du Chatelet's Foundation of Physics, and of course, very, very important, the um, edition of uh, the uh, Emily Du Chatelet's correspondence in French by uh, Scholving and Brown for several years. To um, mention um, just one example, a little bit more in detail, is uh, the new edition of Du Chatelet's um, translation of Newton's Principia, which appeared 2015, edited by Michel Tumon. Newton's magnum opus was translated by Emily de Châtelet um, between uh, 1742 and um, 49 till her uh, death. And a part of the work was published in 1756, seven years after her death. And the complete work appeared in 1759. Um, in is the Tournon's edition is the first um, critical edition. Preprints appeared uh, before that critical edition. And what makes this work so important is that uh, it's so sole and still the leading French translation of Newton's Principia, for which Voltaire wrote the full forward. It is noteworthy that a commentary was added that is composed of two parts. Exposition à Brochet and Solution Analytique. And the first part tells the history of astronomical models back to the Babylonians and Pudua Kaugarean up to Newton's death. This part aims to highlight the specificity of Newton's approach and explains the result obtained by him. And the second technical part presents algebraic equivalents for disputed and difficult sections of the Principia, for example, planetary orbits under the force of attraction or the refraction of light based on the principle of attraction. Instead of Newton's geometric method in the Principia, analytical formulas are used based on Leibniz's differential calculus, which was developed further by the Bernoullis, Leonard Euler, Alain Baer, and, and others in the 18th century. Michel Tourmont edition offers a faithful transcription of Du Chatelet's translation with an informative introduction and a critical apparatus. The introduction is divided into six chapters after a general overview of Newton's Principia, the challenges of the French translation is delightful. The following chapter provides a detailed explanation and comparison of structure of the different manuscripts and marginal notes. A separate chapter is devoted to the complicated history and prehistory of both editions from um, 1756 and 1759. And the introduction ends with a view of the reception of the translation. Unfortunately, neither the fragment exposition appreciate nor the um, solution analytic is included in this critical edition. The editor reserves the right to publish the commentary in a separate third volume, where he plans to summarize the high, highly influential reception of Duchatelet's translation. The announced critical edition um, provides hope for further studies deepening our understanding of the complexities of the Newtonian heritage and the development of mechanics in the 18th century. Perhaps you are informed better than I, but so far as I know, it's not published till now. Why is this work so important for a better contextualization? Well, I will give you just some examples why I think uh, contextualization um, is very promising um, based on new editions and translations. And um, first of all, it sheds new light on uh, scientific controversies and praise essay questions at that time, uh, which was were very important to conceptual innovations and 
transformations. A um, pretty good example is the energy concept of the time or the history of electricity. Also, this uh, chapter might challenge canonicized readings of classical mechanics, and it helps to revisit the structure of scientific revolutions at that time. So possible very interesting projects, I think, would be to look a little bit more into detail on Emily du Châtelet's interpretation and translation on, of Newton's derivation of Kepler's law. And it also a very interesting project seems to me to look a little bit more into detail on alternative concepts in 18th century philosophy and physics regarding the so-called emergence of space and time. It would be the, beyond uh, the scope of my talk to go into detail into all these topics and matters. I have published uh, some articles in the last years regarding these uh, topics. But just um, before I am going to that, just uh, give you an example regarding um, the importance to compare a little bit closer Newton's derivation of Kepler's laws in the Principia and um, Du Châtelet's engagement with this topic in her Institution Physique and then going further to her translation and commentary of Newton's Principia. Classical mechanics is often seen from a common viewpoint as a stable period of science. However, historians and philosophers of science are well aware that this is not quite the case. Concept as cognitive tools to handle the world and solve problems uh, played an key role and these concepts um, as we are um, acquainted today regarding uh, force, matter, um, action, etc., cetera, um, were not given at that time. Um, on the contrary, there were a plurality of approaches present and may, may be regarded as the age of classical mechanics. And um, it is often maintained in the classical readings regarding classical mechanics, so the can or better to say the canonicized readings of classical mechanics, that um, Newton used calculus to derive and unify the three laws of calculus. These laws were found from the early astronomical observations of Tycho Brahe and um, also were presented in Kepler's laws while at the same time setting forth some general ideas about differential equations. But um, what Newton did in, is in, in his Principia was to use geometrical methods. Um, from an anachronistic point of view, an integral is a conservation law in the case of Newtonian mechanics. Um, um, in the case of Newtonian mechanics, the two integrals finds correspond to conservation of energy and momentum. In mathematical, an integral reduces the number of dimensions, but this is very anachronistic. It was not given at Newtonian uh, physics, neither in the 17th nor 18th century. And it was um, highly disputable at that time what Newton's concept of a quantity of motion and the quantity of matter means. And uh, Du Châtelet made a crucial step further to go beyond Newton's concept and to integrate new concepts, what became known later as um, conservation principles. Some may be skeptical, such challenges are a task for experts and even for them difficult and too broad and extensive to manage because of the huge material we have. I don't think one should 
be too skeptical. There are, I think, um, possibilities and methods to integrate du Chatelet into teaching practice without assuming too much previous knowledge. And this is my last point, uh, examples how to integrate du Chatelet better into teaching practices or to science education. The history of physics and philosophy is a brilliant example, I think, uh, of a course of study forcing us to re-examine what is already known. Conversely, current developments in physics and philosophy motivate us to revive their histories. In the face of the growing awareness of the importance of gender issues in both physics and philosophy, we come to realize that women made significant contributions to science from the earliest times, although they have been often systematically marginalized and ignored. The challenge is to make this clear and to foster the students' awareness of this problem. And for this reason, I have, a develop my, I have developed a um, role play. Um, let's assume that you hold an introductory course about history, philosophy, and science education, and we want to integrate Duchatelet's contribution to that. Um, for Edward students, so to say, of different departments, you proceed by organizing a role play. A role play is an educational technique that helps to deepen the understanding of the complexity and interdependencies of a situation, a topic, a problem, a knowledge field, a theory, etc. It helps learners to develop critical thinking and cultural skills. A role play is best suited for an actor-centered approach, which is crucial, important resource for better understanding of scientific practice. So ask students to take over the roles of a physicist, a philosopher, and a historian, and to give a lessons to their colleges. The purpose of this exercise is to provide insights into different perspectives of style of thoughts, um, one on the same topic, uh, example is Newton's axioms of motion. One might object that this task is too difficult for students. However, that depends on what you might expect and what um, help you offer. And um, so this is what is um, my experience and so to say conclusion or an outlook what I've worked out with uh, students. The physicist presents the Newton's axioms of motion as you can find in classical textbooks and canonized and standard readings. Um, the first law states if the net force, the vector sum of all zero, then the velocity of the object is constant. The second law um, states um, that um, um, F is um, the um, um, mass uh, times acceleration. And uh, of course, the uh, third axiom is the famous action and reaction principle. And in short, you can see it here, how the um, axioms of motion can be written in the following formally sized way. Um, however, uh, the philosopher um, is not um, yeah, convinced about this presentation. Um, the philosopher might argue if you present Newton's axioms of motion in this way, um, one might get the impression that the first law, the law of inertia, is a corollary of the second law. And that would mean that uh, it's a, just a special case, uh, um, force is zero, which implies a vanishing acceleration, thus uniform motion. And um, this um, would um, caricature the um, uh, concept of axioms because if you can reduce the one sentence to the other sentence, then the one is no longer an axiom of the other. 
But is this really the case? The second law only holds an inertial reference frame. The first law cannot be a special case of the second law because the first law uh, defines an inertial reference frames. In turn, from the first law, we um, uh, learn um, that um, force is something that which causes a change of motion or rest. So, and this is a problem discussed in teaching practices till today. And this, now the historian comes into play and he argues that the way in which Newton's law should be understood has been discussed by historians of science for such a long time along with the relations between Newton's own and um, uh, formulations and the different translations and modifications. And um, of course, you cannot find a modern equation uh, in um, the 17th or 18th century um, physics. And again, this is a big problem for teaching classical mechanics. And then let's integrate Emilie du Châtelet's intervention in this discussion. And let's compare uh, Emilie du Châtelet's formulation of the axioms as presented in chapter 11 in the Institution Physique and later in her translation of Newton's Principia. Um, I want to go into more in, into detail or uh, word by word how Du Châtelet formulated here the um, laws of motions and um, how she came to uh, reformulate it in um, her translation of Newton's Principia. Um, but it's really worth to look at uh, into detail because here it's a pretty good example that the first, second, and third law is absolutely not the same as you can find in Newton's Principia, neither in the French nor in the original in Latin nor in the um, English translation. But now what happens in her translation um, of Newton's Principia is very remarkable. In her uh, commentary um, of her translation, she reformulated Newton's laws of motions as follows. Everybody perceives in itself in its state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line. And the change of motion is always proportional to the moving force in its direction of this force and action and reaction are always equal and opposite. This is amazing because it's for the first time a really modern translation and interpretation of Newton's axioms of motions. So what we can learn, the lesson from this example is that in today's teaching practice, inertial motion is interpreted as an uncursed motion. Du Châtelet's insight was that Newton's impressed force, that means the cause of the change of a body's motion, has to be distinguished from Leibnizian force, that means the capacity or power to act inherent to matter, which later became known as energy um, concept. And um, for this shift from Newton's concept to a modernized version of classical mechanics, which introduces the concept of energy into this theory, Du Châtelet made an, a crucial and important contribution. So now let me come to the conclusion. The aim of my talk was to make clear that we should teach our students about the academic history of our fields and uh, to discuss the interdisciplinary relationship with other fields and to integrate um, women's works and biographies into this history. Today, there's a large consensus in science that and also in politics and society about the relevance and necessity for advancing gender equality and promoting women. Despite increased measures and initiatives for gender appropriate research and teaching and for founding programs, 
Women are still strongly underrepresented in science and especially in philosophy. While gender and diversity issues are at the top of the agenda of other sciences, disciplines, and scientific cultures. And gender research has long since found its way into practice, there's a considerable research deficit in philosophy of science vis-a-vis -vis such approaches, apart from a few critical voices from feminist science studies. The aim of my talk was to provide guidance on how to make women's participation in research visible from an historical, constructive and systematic point of view by using selected examples from philosophy and history and physics, focusing, for example, on Du Chatelier's uh, work and impact. So thank you for listening my talk.